here. Um, this is a little bit of an unusual role for me. Usually I'm talking to people that are the experts. And tonight you're listening to me like I'm going to have the answers. So I'll do my best. <laughs> but what I thought would be fun here is to uh, kind of navigate the different, the many different uh, Book of Mormon geography theories. And so I'll just start out and say I don't endorse any particular one of these. Um, you know, gospel tangents, I kind of like to view a, a 360 degree view of, of Mormonism. And so that includes, you know, all many of the different branches of the restoration. And uh, just just like with the Book of Mormon, I like to look at all the theories. And so I know we, we kind of go over different ones um, each week, but I thought I'd kind of give an overview of, of all of all of the different theories. So um here we go. So what I thought we could do is kind of start a little bit out with uh, Middle Eastern geography. Uh, most of this comes from a film put out by, uh, mainly by BYU uh, called Journey of Faith. They've got the DVD there. Um, and they seem to think that the frankincense trail seems to be the likely route that uh, Lehi and his family um, proposed and so you can I've got a link there you, if you want to watch that it's it's pretty good it's a well definitely well done video um, and there's a link there um, and one of the the what proponents would call a bullseye is where uh, in first Nephi 1634 when it came to pass that Ishmael died and was buried in a place which was called Nahum and so uh, basically um, that's one of the best spots that we have for uh, for Book of Mormon geography, and it, and it talks about it. There's uh, several quotes in there that um, this Nahum is on the the uh, frankincense trail. I might go out of order here. I wanted to show a little bit uh, on the map here. Um, so on that that left map, you can see that basically they left uh, Jerusalem, headed mostly south um, down to the Wadi. Well, actually, where it crosses. Where that word Timna there, they kind of cross that uh, the river there, and they're on the uh, western side of the Red Sea, and that's where they probably joined up with the uh, Frankincense Trail. Uh, if you look at the middle map there, uh, you can see that the Frankincense Trail goes into the Sinai Peninsula, but that's really where um, Lehi and his family probably joined that into Arabia and then took a left turn. Uh, there at uh, on that third map at the bottom there and headed. Now, there's a few different sites there uh, for um, different potential harbors uh, for Nephi's harbor. But um, of course, in, in the interest of uh, giving all perspectives, um, of course, not everybody believes Nahum is a, is a bullseye. Um, John Hamer left a comment and said uh, it should come as no surprise or no shock to us that Nahum, which has a which is spelled with a U instead of an O, a Hebrew prophet in the Bible has a Semitic name. It should therefore come as no shock that there are places in Semitic speaking countries that share that name, or at least the consonants N H M. Of course, uh, Hebrew a lot of times leaves out a lot of the vowels, and so. Um, John says, when I first wrote about Nahum on a black on a bulletin board, did a quick test. I said to myself, they speak Arabic in Iraq. Let's see if there's a Nahum in Iraq. And a quick Google search picked up a place called Nahum in the Mason province, immediately south of Al Amara. In other words, if the Book of Mormon had said that Lehi and his party traveled past Babylon, there was another potential Nahum bullseye waiting in Mesopotamia. Another Google search shows that historically there was a town called Nahem in Lebanon, halfway between Tyre and, and Acre. If Joseph Smith, Smith had sent Lehi to America via Phoenicia, there would have been another bullseye. So uh, he, he basically goes on to say it's not really a bullseye. He questions whether it's even noteworthy, um, given when the entire volume of large Semitic country in which to find a Semitic root. Um, there's a Nim in Arabia, which is not precisely a match to Nahum, but you know the three letters match. And so anyway, not everybody is convinced, but um, in, in Journey of, um, you know, this is of course where uh, 
Ishmael died and was buried in the place of, of Nahum on the uh, frankincense trail. Um, so anyway, that's um, kind of the, the, pro the most likely route and probably the best archeological evidence for the Book of Mormon. Um, there's a couple of possible ports in Yemen. I know you mentioned we have George Potter coming up in a few weeks. I spoke with George, oh geez, it's probably been about three years ago. Um, and uh, he's, he's done a lot of work. He thinks that the harbor is called Korori in Yemen. Um, there's another theory promoted by Warren P. Aston called Kor Kofut. Um, and uh, his book is called In the Footsteps of Lehi. Um, I've got a link to his book there. And uh, of course, George has a book, Lehi in the Wilderness. And of course, I've got the, uh, the interviews you can see there on my website. And honestly, those are pretty close together. Um, both of them are, are, are really good potential harbors for where Nephi built his ship. Um, so uh, that's that. And I'll just say, if you guys have any questions, if you want to interrupt me, you know, go ahead um, and, and ask questions as we go along here. But um, I'll just keep going. So um, the uh, in Journey of Faith, the interesting thing is basically, um, if you look at this place here on the left, that's probably where Nephi's Harbor was, either Korokofut or Korori. Um, they believe that they, tr they uh, basically hug the land, uh, you know, going down by India. And you can see here, um, according to Journey of Faith, they go right by the Malay Peninsula. So we'll be, we'll be talking about that in a, in a few um, slides here in a minute. And then uh, basically make the jump across um, to the Americas. And of course, it's kind of funny because they, they think they're all land huggers here, but then Obviously, when you get out to the Pacific Ocean, there's, there's, you're going to have to go over some open water eventually to get to the Americas. So, um, so then the question is, well, where did they go? So I'm going to start kind of with the historical uh, case, which was a hemispheric model. Um, I think, I don't know how it is in the community of Christ. I think there's a lot of uh, people in the LDS church that probably still imagine this uh, as kind of the model. You've got your narrow neck of land here kind of uh, Colombia, you know, Panama, that area. Um, although you will notice here, if you look closely at the map, the narrow neck there between the, the North and South America is actually kind of an east-west orientation rather than north-south. So um, that's kind of interesting. So of course, um, you know, the pros to the hemispheric model, that's pretty much what the early saints and current members probably still think. Um, you know, and everybody thinks about the narrow neck of land being in near Panama. The problem is the distances don't match. And of course, we've got a big problem with DNA um, that doesn't match. It seems that uh, most of the uh, Native Americans that we've done DNA testing on uh, seem to match uh, a kind of a Siberian uh, Asian migration, probably up by uh, the Bering Strait in Alaska. Um, so this, this model has pretty much fallen out of favor. Um, John Sorensen has uh, put together a book. Um, and so he says, really, we need to, to come up with uh, kind of an internal map. And this is the cover of his book here, Mormon's Map. Um, you can see kind of a narrow neck of land, kind of a north-south orientation. Um, so this map is based on internal evidences of the Book of Mormon. Uh, John L. Sorensen is probably the most respected expert on Book of Mormon theories. Uh, of course, he believes in kind of a Central American limited geography model. I'm going to kind of start uh, with Sorensen, and, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll kind of end with him as well. Um, he, he does address some of the other theories as well, and if any of you are interested in that book, I've got a link to it there. Um, but that's kind of the idea uh, of of what we think based on the internal evidences of the Book of Mormon, what uh, Mormon's map probably likely looked like. So um, I thought I would first start off with a, a very uh, different theory, uh, the African theory uh, by Mbe, Mbe Melikin. 
Um, so this is kind of an interesting theory. Obviously, it's not in the Americas. Um, so I will say this, you know, we did see uh, if, if Nephi left Yemen, it would be a lot easier to go to Eritrea or Ethiopia than any of the other places. So it, it kind of has that advantage of being a relatively short trip. Uh, you can see Eritrea is on the border of the Red Sea. Uh, so you're kind of still staying within the Middle Eastern model. Um, so uh, Melikin has written a couple of books, uh, the African Bible, uh, this one on top, I think is the first edition, the one on the bottom is the second edition. I looked on Amazon, it was like, the top, the top one is like $800. So I don't think anybody's gonna be buying that one. Um, so I guess, uh, but the, the, I think it's basically the same book. They've just got two different covers. Um, but he basically thinks that uh, the Book of Mormon came place, uh, took place in Africa. Um, he says the Sabaeans are the Nephites and the Agazians are the Lamanites. Um, he kind of also believes that the Bible took place in Africa. So he definitely <laughs> seems to have an African bias there. Um, so uh, you can actually preview the book. Um, I've got a Google link here. You can read, he's got another book called 80 Reasons Why the Book of Mormon is an African Bible. So from what I understand, he uh, he's just kind of read the Book of Mormon on his own. He's not a member of any restorationist church, um, but he believes it is the word of God. Um, and uh, so this, this book, 80 Reasons Why the Book of Mormon is an African Bible is available at that link. Um, I've got a uh, rebuttal from the Scholars Archive BYU where um, they, they kind of, they question a lot of his uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, Malikin is not a scholar. Um, it's probably the least scholarly of any of the theories out there. Um, and so that's, that's kind of um, what it's got going against it. But I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the pros and cons of all of the different theories. Pros, um, Eritrea, Ethiopia are relatively close to Egypt and Israel for that matter, and Yemen. So, um, it would have been a lot easier trip. Um, I will say, now this isn't part of his theory, but um, there is a tradition that the lost Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Queen of Sheba to Ethiopia and, Ethiopia, and she was, of course, wife of King Solomon. Of course, we've lost the, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant, but there's a, a tradition that goes past centuries, I believe, that uh, the Ark is located in Ethiopia, and of course, they won't let anybody look at it. Um, so, you know, that kind of is, is a little bit of a pro. Another, another thing uh, with regards to Africa, there is a DNA link, um, unlike most of the other theories. Uh, there's a, a Cohen haplotype, which is basically kind of a gene that is common to modern day Jews. And uh, it was found among the Lemba tribe now, the problem is the Lemba tribe is found in Zimbabwe and South Africa. Uh, Melikan seems unaware of this and likes to focus on Ethiopian Eritrea. Um, but, you know, if I think if, if we would look at Africa, you know, the, the Horn of Africa, the Southern Africa, especially South Africa, if you're going to make a case for the Book of Mormon being in, in, in South Africa, you, you're going to have a lot better chance. Um, with the DNA link. The other interesting thing about the Lemba tribe is um, a lot of their customs are very Old Testament, that they've, they've really kept a lot of the Old Testament cu customs. Interesting thing, they seem to have, they claim that they left Jerusalem around 600 BC, which would kind of match um, Lehi, but there's not a lot of other matches as far as I'm aware of. And of course, uh, the skin of darkness makes a lot more sense <laughs> if the Lamanites uh, intermarried with local Africans. Um, that would that would of course make a lot more sense. Um, cons of the theory: uh, he's not a scholar. He's not even a Latter Day Saint. You know, I guess you can take that as a pro or con. Uh, he also seems to believe the Bible occurred in Africa. He's very unfamiliar with LDS scholarship on geography. Uh, some of his language connections are pretty specious and, and weak, I would say. And he has no idea how the, the plates got to New York. So um, 
So that's kind of a little summary of the African theory. Um, next theory that's, uh, that's definitely different is the Malay theory by Dr. Ralph Olson. Um, Ralph passed away, gosh, about five years ago. So unfortunately, I, I actually spoke with Ralph before he passed away. And, and this, was, this is a really fun theory. I know a lot of people um, will look at this theory and say, Asia, Southeast Asia, how can this be? Um, but one of the, the one of the nice things about this is, number one, you've got a uh, north-south orientation on a, on a peninsula here, um, and um, so it kind of matches Mormon's map that you know that we mentioned a few slides ago with with Dr. Olson. Um, the word Thailand means land of the free. You know, we talk about the Book of Mormon being, um, or in the Book of Mormon, it mentions. Uh, that America will be, a, or the, the promised land, I shouldn't say America, so it never says America. The promised land is a land of liberty. And uh, so this area has never been colonized by any of the uh, Western powers. And so, you know, that, that could be a, a case where you could say, oh, did not know Thailand means land of the free, but that's kind of interesting. Um, Casey Kern did a four-part review of this theory at Wheaton Tares. I've got a link there if you'd like to see um, so this could include uh, modern day Thailand, Malaysia, and Burma. Um, and I've actually got an interview with Casey coming up uh, in about a month. And we're, we're gonna go in, in, into a lot more detail than I'm going uh, in this presentation. Um, but the, the thing, let's see. Oh, well, well, the thing that I like about this is, um, a lot of the anachronisms that the Book of Mormon critics complain about, gold, um, horses, elephants, uh, that sort of thing, disappear um, completely with this theory. So wheat, barley is, has been used uh, in the right time period. Um, so uh, Dr. Olson's first manuscript um, is, is called the Malay Peninsula. I've actually got it on my website. Um, Vani Rivas is Ralph Olson's daughter. She's on the on the call here tonight, and uh, she gave me permission to put this on my website. So if you're interested, um, this is a kind of the free version of the the book here. Um, you can purchase the book there, but um, the free version is now on my website at that link there. Uh, the website is down right now. Uh, Vani's trying to get it back up, um, and then uh, Brant Gardner has kind of a rebuttal at the Interpreter Foundation. Um, that uh, he, he takes some issues with it. Um, but I thought I'd once again go over some, some of the pros and cons. Uh, one of the nice things about the Malay theory, it supports both a boat migration uh, that Nephi and Lehi Nephi took and a land migration with the Mulekites. Um, and so that's, that's kind of interesting. Elephants, horses, plants are all found in, uh, on the Malay Peninsula. Um, there's a, a, a documentarian named Simka Yakubovich, and he, uh, in, this, in this film here, Quest for the Lost Tribes, Simka is a, I'm trying to remember what he call, refers to himself. I think he refers to himself as an atheist Jew, but he has a, a huge interest. He's done a, a couple of films on the Lost Tribes. He's done one on uh, Moses and the, and the uh, uh, the, the plagues of Egypt and the Exodus and that sort of a thing. But anyway, in this film, Quest for the Lost Tribes, um, he believes that the tribe of Manasseh settled in the Malay Peninsula uh, in his film, Quest for the Lost Tribes. So that's kind of an independent little thing there. Uh, the, pen, the, the peninsula matches quite well. The distances match. There really aren't any anachronisms. It's more likely to support DNA evidence. I know uh, National Geographic has been doing a, uh, trying to get a uh, genomic study on various parts of the world. And I'm trying to find out, uh, you know, if you, if you believe the, the DNA history that um, America was populated by Southeast Asians, well, this, it's potentially, this, this could kind of fit that as well. Um, I'm trying to define, there's a, there's a group of people um, 
called the Karens. It looks like when you spell it, it looks like the name Karen, like a, a woman's name Karen, but they're called the Karens. They claim to have uh, Jewish ancestry. Uh, I've been ab unable to dis determine if their DNA supports that. I, I haven't been able to find that. I, I, I think it might not, but I, I haven't been able to, to nail that down yet. Um, so Thailand, as I mentioned earlier, means land of freemen freedom similar to the land of liberty in second nephi and of course it would be much easier to go 4000 miles rather than 16000 miles uh, to the americas so those are kind of some of the pros there cons uh, it's definitely one of the most unusual theories out there um, it's also got little support among scholars you know most people kind of get behind john sorensen and and that group um, we'll talk about some other theories too uh, book of mormon and early church leaders said the book of mormon uh, was about the inhabitants of this continent. Uh, when I mentioned that to Rolf, Ralph Olson, he met, he said, yes, but it also says, and from whence they came. And so he thinks that they could, uh, this could be complementary with, with some of the other theories. Oops, didn't mean to go forward there. Um, one of the other issues, uh, just like with Embe Melikin, how did the plates get to New York? Um, when I asked Ralph that, he said, well, Moron, I lived about 30 years after the last war. In 30 years, you can pretty much go anywhere in the world and Pleasant Angel can move them anywhere um, that, uh, that he wants. So, so that's kind of the melee theory. Um, the Baja theory, this is a, uh, oops, sorry. I'm trying to move this thing around so I can see. Uh, whoops, back up here. Melee, uh, the Baja theory. Uh, this was, uh, I interviewed uh, David Rosenval. He's him and his dad. Uh, his dad was a geographer at, um, I think he was at BYU, if I remember right. Um, uh, you can see his website there, uh, a choiceland.com. Um, and I've got the interviews. I interviewed him a while back. He basically believes the Baja Peninsula, uh, which is, of course, <clears throat> just below Southern California and across the, the bay there from uh, mainland Mexico. Um, once again, it has a north-south orientation. So that seems to be a, a benefit. Um, it's got a similar climate to the Mediterranean. A lot of times, uh, you know, Nephi says that uh, they took seeds with them and the seeds grew and so uh, you know, they probably wouldn't grow very well in New York, uh, but, uh, you know, being a Mediterranean climate, uh, the, theoretically these, these seeds would have grown. Uh, David also says this is compatible with the Mesoamerican theory, and he, he says that maybe they started in Baja and then perhaps migrated over to, to mainland Mexico. Um, the peninsula matches, the distances match. Um, he says there are no anachronisms. I, I take a little bit of issue with that. Um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, the Book of Mormon and early church leaders said the Book of Mormon was about the inhabitants of this con continent. So um, that would be uh, another advantage there. Uh, one of the things that uh, David has done is he says that there are some uh, similarities between Uto Aztecan language and Semitic languages. And so they've done some research on there. I think we, we need to get some more on that. Um, but he thinks that uh, there are elements of Semitic languages in uh, Aztec languages. Um, some of the cons, the, the biggest, you know, he said that there are no anachronisms. Uh, one of the claims is the elephants, horses, plants are, and are found here. Uh, the problem is the elephants and the horses are found in the La Brea tar pits which are in the Baja Peninsula, but um, the carbon dating dates those to the last ice age, which is 10 to 20,000 years ago. So um, yes, there were elephants, there were horses, but there, we haven't found anything that date to the time of Lehi. So that's, that's one of the problems. But yes, there have been some things found in the La Brea tar pits. Of course, with all of the American, um, either north or south, you're gonna have DNA problems. We've not been able to identify any uh, pre-Columbian DNA that uh, matches to Middle Eastern DNA. Um, once again, from the Baja, the, you know, once again, how do you get, whoops, 
how do you get the plates from the Baja Peninsula to New York? There were no wheeled transports. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, the Native Americans um, kind of lived in Stone Age techno technologically. And so it would have been very hard for um, uh, Moroni to, to transport the plates. They, they didn't have any wheeled vehicles. Um, there is some growing support among scholars. Uh, so I didn't mean to put that on the cons, actually, that should have been under the pros. Um, you know, they are, uh, David's father, especially, I can't remember his name. He's a geographer. He, I believe he teaches geography at BYU. And um, so there is getting to be a little bit more growing support on there. I uh, need to move that over to the other um, column there. But um, another theory that's kind of a fun theory is kind of this New York Great Lakes theory. Um, <clears throat> the one that I review uh, that I that I'm familiar with is uh, can be found at bookofmormongeography.org. Um, with this theory, it's kind of a limited geography theory in the fact that it, it you know, basically that takes place among the Great Lakes. Um, you can see between the lakes, um, those lakes could be called seas. The Dead Sea in Israel is much smaller than the Great Lakes. Um, so, so if you refer to the Great Lakes as seas, you could, you could argue that. Um, you've got lots of places for narrow necks of land there. Um, and this is, this is the one theory that I'm, I'm most familiar with. Um, there, were, there were some reviews done at a website called Mormon Heretic. And um, it's, it's, these were done back in 2008. So they're a little bit dated. Uh, the website has definitely changed since then. Um, my impression is this, the guy, and I wish I knew who it was that runs it, um, He's not, he's not a scholar at all. Um, if you challenge him on anything, he gets really, really defensive. Um, but there's, you know, being in New York, Great Lakes, one of the things about uh, the Book of Mormon is it never mentions snow or cold. And uh, I can't imagine, especially being around the Great Lakes, there would have been a lot of snowstorms, there would have been a lot of cold. Um, I know, you know, everybody likes to say the Hill Camaro is in New York. Um, you would think that they would have mentioned a snowstorm in um, the Book of Mormon. So Sorensen and most other people think that it was more of a tropical climate. And so that's, that's another problem uh, with the Great Lakes theory. So <clears throat> it's not really, a, as far as um, pros, it's not a north-south peninsula, but it has several candidates for a narrow neck of land. Uh, the lakes could be reasonably construed as seas. Uh, limited geography is more appropriate than, say, a hemispheric model. Um, another pro is it's very near Hill Camorra. Uh, you would have a one Camorra theory. Uh, most of the other theories that we're going to talk about talk about a two Camorra theory, where um, you know Joseph Smith never called the the hill where he found the plates Camorra. That was kind of named after the fact. Um, but people that believe in the New York uh, slash Great Lakes theory, as well as the Heartland theory, a lot of times they will say, oh, you know, there was only one Hill Camorra. And th they'll use the same point that I mentioned with Baja. You know, the Indians or the Native Americans really didn't have a lot of wheeled vehicles. And so transporting those plates thousands of miles would have been very, very difficult. Um, and so, you know, so that that's one of the pros of the New York theories you're only gonna have one Camorra. Cons, you've got DNA problems. We don't have any Native American DNA that matches to um, Israelite DNA. Uh, we don't have any elephants, horses, uh, barley was not used um, and those sort of things. So you've got some anachronisms. Um, the, this, this theory is not scholarly at all. Uh, he tries to identify the Iroquois, um, but they don't date to the right time period. And uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Book of Mormon never mentions snow, and the, so the climate doesn't seem to match. Um, another theory is the South American theory. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. Now, this is a book um, by Venice Pritis. Um, I don't know if you guys know Ron Pritis from Signature Books. Um, I, I like to give Ron a hard time. Venice is Ron's mother, and um, Ron. <laughs> 
Ron's not really a believer anymore, and he's he's kind of embarrassed that his mom wrote this book, but she was a believer in the Book of Mormon. Um, if, if you look at this map, of course, down the center, you see here, this is kind of the Amazon River Basin. And so the idea here with this is that this was all flooded. And, um, and so if you look over on the, on the West Coast, you've got uh, Peru and uh, the, looks like it's, it's got a narrow neck of land uh, right, right here. And so um, if you look at this, then you can say, oh, wow, well, this, this, this makes more sense as far as having a peninsula, a north-south peninsula. Um, a lot of the climate matches this as well. Um, some of the, the people who, who support this theory um, are Venice Pritis and, and I can't remember, Coker Hands was the first one. I will tell you what, this was one of the first uh, Book of Mormon geography models that I had ever heard um, about 20 years ago. Uh, my girlfriend, which is now my wife at the time, we went on a trip to Hawaii and uh, we went to a, a branch in Hawaii and the branch president was a big proponent of this model. And um, so it was kind of funny because he, uh, he, he was really a big fan of Venice Pritis. Um, George Potter has kind of some variations on this model as well. Um, and his, his website's nephiproject.com. There's another guy by the name of Del, Dow, Del Dowdell uh, at nephicode.blogspot.com. Um, so I don't want to say all three of these theories are the same, but they're, you know, as far as locationally, they're very similar. Um, the idea is the Incas were the, the Lehites or the Lamanites and Nephites. Um, I know that uh, Venice Pritis spent a lot of time kind of like similar with the Baja theory you know, they brought seeds and the, the um, seeds grew in the Americas. Um, the, the problem with Venice's map here is that this was true about 18 million years ago. So your timeline is a bit off. And uh, of course, I've got a link to the uh, Smithsonian Magazine there. And so that's, that's kind of a, a big problem, <laughs> you know, being off 18 million years. So it's, that's kind of hard to Hard to argue that that's what the land was like when, when Lehigh landed here. Um, so some pros of the South American theory, if you believe that the Amazon Basin River was flooded, then you do have a North-South Peninsula. It's at the wrong time period though. You've got a similar climate to the Mediterranean. The peninsula matches, the distances are an okay match. Um, church leaders actually embrace North and South America as land of the of the Nephites. Oh, I didn't mean to leave that Uto at Tegan. That was not, that's that's a leftover from uh, the Baja theory. That wasn't supposed to be there. Um, cons, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's off by 18 million years. You've got DNA problems. You don't have steel. You don't have iron. Um, are the horses alpacas? I guess you could argue it, but you don't have elephants. Um, some of the, the, I know George especially has mentioned that there, they have found some iron ore, but it was used in paint. It wasn't used to make swords. Um, and so, you know, the steel swords, that can be a problem. Once again, how did the plates get to New York? You know, there weren't any ve wheeled vehicles. I guess you could have taken a, a boat route to, to get to New York, but um, that can be a problem as well. And so you'd, you'd have to believe in a kind of a two Kimura theory as well. Uh, the Heartland theory. I don't know if Jonathan Neville's here. He'll probably correct me on a few things. Um, and I know that um, Meldrum, May and Neville kind of all have slightly different takes on this theory, but um, this is the one that I found uh, kind of gives you an idea of where Zarahemla, Nephi, Lehi places are, Kimura. Um, one of the benefits of this theory is, you know, this is kind of where Joseph Smith grew up. He was familiar with the legends of the Indians or the Native Americans. And um, so you can see that a lot of this would have been incorporated um, with, with Joseph Smith's thinking. Um, once again, this looks like a really large section of area. I don't I don't think it fits the the uh, limited geography theory, especially that uh, you know 
whether you believe Sorensen or not, you've got to you've got to say a lot of the work he's done on on distances makes a lot of sense, and so this seems a little bit more uh, spread out than it than it probably should be. You know, we're talking thousands of miles um, when it was we probably should be in the hundreds of miles uh, as far as differences. Um, once again, it's not a north-south peninsula. It has several candidates for your narrow neck of land. Uh, Mississippi or Missouri rivers are plausible for a river siding. Um, lakes could be re reasonably construed as seas. It's very near here, the hill Camorra. So you've got your one Camorra theory. Uh, I know Rod has spent a lot of time, and I'm going to talk about this in, in a couple of slides here, claiming that he solved the Middle East problem with the uh, X lineage and He's going to call that a pro. I'm actually going to call that a con, but I, I left it in the pros here for now. Um, the mound builder culture likely influenced Joseph Smith. Um, cons, you've got the elephants, horses, plants problem. Uh, the mound builders just don't have the, tel the technology to build a temple like unto Solomon. There were no chariots. There were no wheeled vehicles, um, you know, Technologically, the mound builders were, were more kind of stone age technologically. Um, seems unlikely that the Book of Mormon never mentions snow. The climate doesn't seem to match, especially when you're getting into the Great Lakes region. Um, it, it seems to me, you know, I'm speaking on my behalf and so people, people may question this, but I'm, I'm gonna say, it seems like Rod loves to uh, mix science with religion he will use a lot of quotes from early church leaders uh, that support his theory, and then he will ignore some of the other ones. I know there's a quote where Joseph Smith said, and the South American proponents say, you know, that Lehigh landed 30 degrees south latitude, and, and Rod just kind of ignores that completely. Um, Sorensen basically says Joseph didn't know <laughs> everything, and so, um, Another problem with, I think, the, the Meldrum theory, he questions the old earth. He questions carbon dating because it doesn't match his theory. And a lot of that has to do with DNA. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, I already mentioned this. Sorensen mentioned Joseph landed in Chile, then the Yucatan, and then New York. And Meldrum, a lot of times, cherry picks quotes from Joseph and ignores the ones that don't help him. And the con cons, DNA problems. So most DNA experts say that Meldrum is misinterpreting the DNA science. And so I've actually got uh, on the next three slides, um, my three DNA experts, um, Ugo Perego, um, he's a population geneticist of all, of all the DNA experts, like this is in his wheelhouse. Um, and he, he says, as far as the X2A lineage, it's good thinking, but it is not well founded. The Kennewick man was a skeleton found on the Columbia River in the state of Washington, close to the Canadian border. It's dated to about eight to 9,000 years ago with carbon dating. So once again, this is why um, Meldrum attacks carbon dating. Um, he has, this Kennewick man has features that look very European. They're non-typical of Native Americans. Uh, they did a, a whole genetic sequence on him and his DNA is actually Native American. He belongs to X, X2A, which is the same marker that uh, Rod Meldrum says is for the Great Lakes, but it's found in the Northwest coast close to the Beringia Passage. So it's actually farther away from the Heartland theory. It's the oldest X2A found in America, meaning that all the others are a subgroup of that one. So he's been here the longest. His autosomal DNA is also Native American. So he's not European, but he has X2A. Um, X2A has never actually been found in the Middle East. Other X lineages have been found, but not this particular one. Um, X2A is not younger than the other X lineages, meaning it did not come from them gen genealogically. Um, and then he kind of explains that a little bit more. So X2A is not a daughter of the Xs in the Middle East. As of today, they have never found an X2A in any other parts of the world but the Americas. And because the Kinuik man has these features, it seems to me to po point more towards a Beringia arrival than the others. Basically, that's the land bridge um, between Alaska and Russia. Um, I also talked to Simon Southerton. Of course, he's more of a critic 
Um, and this is what he had to say. Meldrum thinks that the scientists foolishly overlooked the connection of the X lineage to the Middle East. His, bull, his whole business is built on the X lineage claim and he's wrong, completely wrong. It's a very ancient lineage. It's, it's the only Native American and it's a rare lineage in America. Um, the X lineage doesn't even occur in South or Central America. It has only been found in North America. And th that's because it's rare in the populations it came from in Asia only a couple of a percent. <laughs> he says, all this brouhaha is about a letter of the alphabet. If they had named it differently or if it had a slightly different naming convention, there would be nothing there because the X is in the name for a huge cluster of very ancient family of mitochondrial DNA lineages. There's the X1 branch, X2 and X2A right through J. So um, all the other lineages are found in Eurasia somewhere most of them are among the Druze, and that's the one Meldrum has paid all his attention to. It's very distant related. They share a common ancestor 30,000 years ago, so his complaint is completely wrong. You know, once again, he's, his time period's off. And that's why, that's a big reason why uh, Meldrum attacks the old earth theories and, and carbon dating, because it, it, it messes up his whole DNA spiel. Uh, Thomas Murphy, third DNA expert. Um, he teaches genetics at Edmonds College up in uh, Washington. Um, he says, I think the criticism of Meldrum is appropriate because he's not coming from a, from a scientific perspective at all. He's coming from a creationist perspective. <coughs> he doesn't even believe the world is that old. So um, he doesn't think there were people here 30,000 years ago. And anyway, so I think I've kind of hit that <laughs> um, pretty hard. So. Um, all right, moving on. Boy, I need to get a drink here. All right, Mesoamerican theory. This is uh, Dr. Sorensen's theory. Like I said, this is probably the most, uh, has the most scholars behind it. Um, you've got Sorensen's map on the top. There is another, or other variations like uh, Garth Norman. Uh, I'm trying to get Garth on my podcast he has a different candidate for the River Sidon, and he takes a few issues, but basically the, the overall map is pretty similar. You can see you've got the land bountiful, land desolation. Once again, as we look at this, if this is your narrow neck of land, it's more of a east-west orientation than north-south. Um, so, it, you know, that's a little bit of a problem. And I know Sorensen puts a lot in the, in the Yucatan Peninsula as well. Um, Sorensen has a couple of books um, you can purchase them there. The bottom one there, an ancient American setting for the Book of Mormon is probably the most scholarly one. Um, you've got Brant Gardner's review. Um, of course, Brant's a big fan of, uh, of the Mesoamerican theory. And I would say that the majority of people in uh, that, that believe in a literal Book of Mormon probably support this theory the most. Um, the BYU also put out another DVD. It's also called The Neuro, uh, Journey of Faith, The New World. Uh, so it, it talks mostly about uh, the uh, uh, Central American theory, Mesoamerican theory. Um, the prose, uh, it's supported by the most scholars. It's the best researched. All other limited geography theories depend on Sorensen's work. Your distances match. He seems to have identified the Olmec and the Maya as the, uh, the Olmec are the Jaredites and the Maya are the Lamanites, Nephites. Um, Sorensen has identified pre-Columbian contact. Uh, some of the cons, more of an east-west orientation than north-south. Yucatan Peninsula is not really that narrow. The DNA doesn't match. Once again, how, does it, how do the plates get to New York? Uh, Sorensen proposes a two Camorra theory where the last battle took place in Central America and then, um, you know, Moroni had 30 years to get it to New York. So 30 years, you can move anything. Um, still have a problem with elephants, horses, plants, etc. So uh, of course, all of the American theories suffer from that. So anyway, that's that's what I have. So we can open it up to, to questions. There's my contact information, and and uh, I, I will also add 
I'll stop sharing here in just a minute. Um, that uh, my bill, well, here, I'll go back so you can, if anybody you want to write that down. I will share this PowerPoint with anybody who wants one. Um, I've given one to uh, Paul and and uh, Robert Cook and, and uh, you know, I just kind of wanted to, to give a, a broad overview of, uh, of all of the theories and, and talk about all of their strengths, all of their weaknesses. You know, there's no theory that answers all the questions. There is no bullseye. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, it's a, it's a fun topic and I, I like to, um, talking about some of these theories. Oh, I should also mention one other thing really quickly. Um, if I go back to Melee, um, <clears throat> I was talking to Vani last night on the phone and she told me that, uh, um, well, I don't really have a good map of Africa, do I? Um, she told me that uh, she thinks that uh, Moroni could have left from Malay Peninsula, gone around the Horn of Africa and then to the Atlantic, well, and maybe stopped off in Madagascar. There are some uh, cities, the Comoros Islands and something else. Maybe Vani, you can step in there if I saying that wrong. But um, so he proposes it could have been an Atlantic crossing rather than a Pacific crossing. So I just wanted to mention that as well. So anyway, let me go ahead and I'll open it up. I'll stop sharing and I'll open it up for questions. Let me thank you for the uh, excellent sketch of the over an overview. Uh, I have been ad advocating for someone to to uh, present on the African theory, and um, and haven't had anyone volunteer for that. And so your sketch is the first we've actually had on Millikan. I do have his book on the AD evidences and find it rather interesting. Um, I had the impression that he had joined the uh, LDS Church while he was in Canada, so maybe I need to go back and check that one again. Well, according to, uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote that. Was it, was it the Brant Gardner or Michael Ash? I think one of those two had said that he had had contact with missionaries in Canada, but uh, it was clear to the author that, because he said something about, oh, I visited the temple and talked to the missionaries in the temple. And he's like, I guarantee you didn't talk to any missionaries in any temple. <laughs> since, since our temples are closed, um, to, to uh, you know, we wouldn't have discussions. It would be different if it was the community of Christ temple, but but definitely didn't hit, visit a Mormon temple. Well, the fact that you that we have Vani on the uh, on the uh, four on the seating makes it so. I, I would like very much to intrude to invite her to share, because her father put out this rather remarkable theory. I'm curious about uh, how it was received by his peers. I don't know if Vani's having. Pro oh, Vani, you might need to unmute yourself. I didn't hear a question to me. It was all like I'm not getting. Oh, good the, reception. The, the question was how was how was your father's theory received by the general public? Well, he had a hard time getting anyone to review it. He put off publishing it for about 10 years because he didn't want someone to go over to Malaysia and find the plates and melt them down before BYU went and checked it out. Um, he did get a letter from President Monson saying he was um, impressed with it. I finally got a copy of his book to him. And it, he has over 200 reasons why his theory works better than the Mesoamerican theory. And it seems to me like if there are that many, it's a valid thing to think about. Um, there's like, for instance, when he was talking about Madagascar back in the time of the last battles, 400 AD, unrelated to the book whatsoever, there was a group of people that left the Malaysia area and sailed to Madagascar. And when they landed there, they named a town Moroni and Islands Comoros. And there was another one that started with an L and I'll give it right. And 
my thought it was way more that Moroni left there and sailed to New York to take the plates and bury them in that, that hill. As a woman America, her pounds of grapes didn't have beast or medical or anything to to take or it would be some got very hard. Um there's a hill maw in on current day maps in northern Malaysia northern Malaysia area. There is a town like where Zarahemla should be. There's a town currently called Panamera. And there are a bunch of other ones. I can't remember all of them right off the top of my head, but um, it has an inlet of the sea on the west where Hagoth could have built his ships and taken off. There was a group of darker people in the southern part of Malaysia where the Lamanites could have gone and intermarried. So that could have been the darkening of the skin. There are so many things that work. And the Book of Mormon says that it's a history of the American peoples and the source from whence they sprang. And it doesn't talk very much about um, the Middle East. And Joseph only translated a third of the plates and then they were taken away from him. So that could easily have been Malaysia, the source from whence the, you know, the people came to head over to the Americas. Okay. Anyway, I could talk on and on, and I'm sure you guys have other things you want to talk about, but if you have any questions, you could ask me. Well, let, it, let us invite you to come present, and then we'll, we'll spend an evening uh, so you have your, your 45 minutes to, to talk, and we can have opportunity for some. <laughs> I'll, I'll be in contact. I'm not a very good presenter. I'm kind of shy. Well, by the way, I see Casey is here too. I don't know if you want to add anything, Casey. Um, no, I think I think I don't have anything in particular to add. I think uh, things have been been covered uh, quite well. Um, although I, I just would uh, second the, the opinion that that you know the Malay theory uh, has not gotten its due. Uh, I, I would say in terms of. The attention that it that it warrants, uh, I think it's it's too easily written off as a crackpot uh, theory because it doesn't match uh, America. But um, you know, I've, having having read Ralph's manuscript and and done some uh, independent investigation on some other avenues, uh, I, I have found it to be a very fruitful line of inquiry, and I, I definitely believe it uh, it deserves a seat at the table. It looks like Stephen has a question. <laughs> well. I just have to know because I found out about the theory reading Rough Stone Rolling, and he foot he has it in the footnotes and cites it. Oh, and I didn't I, remember that. Yeah, and so that's how I discovered it. I had no idea. So what what when when it was cited in Rough Stone Rolling, how did that help your father? I mean, I imagine it helped your father and promulgate his theory a little bit more. I didn't know it was in there. Sorry, I, I didn't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, wow, that's a big deal. You know, it gets that in there, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think everybody great. checks the footnotes that closely, except for you. <laughs> Stephen, can you find that? Like look that up. Yeah. Very curious. Yeah, uh, I can find it. Yeah. My dad would have been thrilled about that. Yeah. So he, he references it page 30 to 34. Uh, he talks about different. Let's see here. Just I, I should mention while he's looking that my dad was valedictorian of his high school. Then at BYU, he was salutatorian. He came in right behind a music major, and he always thought that wasn't very fair that he didn't get to be valedictorian. Then he went to Cornell, and he has a doctorate in chemistry. And when he finally retired from being a chemistry professor, he decided, I've always wanted to be a Mormon to figure it out. He started and research so would come to and he'd write them and then he'd look, look it up on whatever the next day not put forth anything unless he found facts to determine whatever he said 
Yeah, he taught it. Was it Montana State or Montana? I can't remember. Montana State University. Yeah, okay, the Bobcats, okay. That's in Missoula, right? A Bozeman. He was a very, very Bozeman. smart man. Okay. He has a bunch of things um, he published and he discovered a way to help people in Africa and stuff grow their plants when they didn't hardly have any water and did a lot to help the world have enough food and other things. But anyway. I think I, I just found the uh, the reference in uh, in Rough Stone Rolling. I, I was actually not aware of this. Um, uh, this is what what Bushman says here. He mentions the most successful attempts at geographical reconstructions are Sorensen, ancient American setting, uh, and Mormon's map. For recent speculations that the Malay Peninsula better conforms to the Book of Mormon description, see Olson. Yeah. There you oh, are. Wow. Yeah. I just what better that thing than Richard Bushman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah I, I couldn't I couldn't find it in here but um it's in here I mean he he has it in the index as a reference and uh mm. yeah so I always thought boy that must have really helped him in this theory and you guys didn't even know about it that's pretty wild well he might have known about it that, okay that doesn't you know I I don't know everything <laughs> on that book that um Rick has on his website was the first book he was writing and then I told him so long shorten the picture so we can your new info that book did. You broke up there. Can you repeat that again? He sat on a lot of the stuff that he researched. So I'm I feel really guilty about that. And he has more stuff that I that he gave to me at the end. I had a hard time getting it from my sister when he died. So I'm still trying to get that fixed up. I have found his uh, criticisms of the Mesoamerican vantage point to be uh, very much on target. And so I appreciated his work. And uh, actually I wrote him a letter and then discovered that he had passed uh, well before my letter got there. So if uh, you or KC would be available for a later presentation, I'd be pleased to work it out on the schedule. Uh, if you'd put your email in the uh, chat box for me, I'd appreciate that. I don't know where yeah, that is. I'll, I'll just add that, like I said, I've got an interview <laughs> not... with Casey coming up in about a month. So um, you guys can see that too. I'll, I'll try to let you know when we publish that. Okay, good, good, thanks. Ron Smith's got a question. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, uh, I was, I was, I'd never heard of the African uh, theory before, and uh, I, I found that interesting that it exists. Uh, I have, you know, questions about it, of course, but, but uh, I didn't know if you were, uh, were aware, but <clears throat> the Ibu tribe in. Uh, in uh, Nigeria, uh, believes that they are of the House of Israel, and uh, but when they came, when there was at the diaspora, uh, their what they told me was that their uh, their forefathers were illiterate and they didn't bring any records with them, and so uh, they didn't they they believe they believe they're of the House of Israel, but. Um, but they didn't have any, you know, connection as far as believing that the Book of Mormon uh, uh, took place there or anything. But uh, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it sounded like Mulekites there. <laughs> yeah, right. But that's that's not so far south as the uh, as the ones you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, I would if. <laughs> If I were if I were to write my own African theory, I would I would definitely try to find more about the Lemba tribe because number one, they're a match to DNA and they they still have Jewish customs um, yeah. that, that date from you know 600 BC. So they would be a much better target than anything in Ethiopia. Although you know the Ark of the Covenant, that's kind of an interesting 
side track thing. Yep. And the the legend of the Queen of Sheba, I think, is kind of interesting. Well, there, there's also another African theory that uh, proposes that the Omec statues are African statues, and uh, that that one again does not have a whole lot of support, but uh, it is an interesting theory because the Olmec statues do have Negroid features. Definitely. Okay, well, Jonathan Neville, I believe is here. And uh, I just uh, wanna kind of speak on his behalf a little bit. Um, I, review, I have reviewed his book, uh, I'll be posting that um, soon, but a couple of things I think um, I find interesting is first of all, uh, Joseph talks about wandering the plains of the Nephites and also um, talks about the Zelf, finding the Zelf mound. So I think that gives a lot of credence to the um, upper Midwest being one of the models. I also think that um, the, the, uh, the big thing is that a lot of people believe that Moroni was teaching Joseph a lot of things and was telling him about the background and who the peoples were and so when, when, when Moroni is telling him these things, uh, let's say if it's just every September 22nd that he's coming and visiting him throughout the years, he's getting an education. I remember some saint I at Kirtland Temple, she, she was uh, visiting there when I was there. And she said that I believe that Joseph was being taught at the University of Kolob uh, uh, by Moroni. And so uh, I kind of think that if, the, if this is how the narrative went and Joseph is identifying sites in the Midwest as being places I would think that Moroni probably told him. Well, I'll tell you yeah. what John Sorensen would say, because basically, you know, Joseph made state, anytime there was an archaeological discovery in South America, Joseph would say, oh, that's the Lamanites, or in Central America, the Yucatan, oh, that's the Lamanite, or, you know, Zelf, that's the Lamanite. So Joseph clearly, I think, believed in more of a hemispheric model, and I think you know, and Sorensen basically said, God didn't tell Joseph everything, and and uh, you know, Joseph didn't know what's going on. Basically, <laughs> I'm I'm saying that a little bit crassly, but that's that's kind of Sorensen's take. So, well, so, since Steve brought it up, I'll say a couple of things. First off, um, I don't know if anybody else here has visited Comoros and the capital of Moroni, but I did because I was curious about all this. And, and it's very interesting, the history of that country and how murky the origins are of the names and, and the history there. Also, I've spent some time in Malaysia and I can see a lot of um, the, the whole Malaysian model does make a lot of sense in terms of if, an internal map, if you accept the idea of an internal map. In fact, I would say that based purely on the interpretations that people make of an internal map, Malaysia is the only one that's an obvious fit, but I, that, I still don't accept it, but it's for different reasons. The other thing is that there is a kind of a, a misunderstanding that uh, Joseph never called the hill Cumorah, but his mother said he did on a couple of occasions, including the, the day after the first visit of Moroni. And he also called it uh, Cumorah before he even got the plates. So some people discount that and, you know, for example, the Saints book quotes uh, her history over about 120 something times, but they omit those sections that where she refers to Joseph calling it um, Camorra. And, and of course, Parley Pratt said that they were teaching that Moroni anciently called the Hill Camorra and Oliver Cowdery visited the repository with Joseph Smith in the Hill Camorra. So there's, there's lots of reasons why uh, many of us still accept the New York um, setting is Kimura. I think the, the one thing that causes the most confusion in all this is the idea that the Book of Mormon describes a, an hourglass shape with the narrow neck of land being in the middle. And that's because of Ether 1020 and, and the LDS canon says, uh, refers to a narrow neck of land, but other places refer to a small neck of land and another place a narrow neck, which could be water or land. And so I, I think that the, the different terms mean different things. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I think Rick did a phenomenal job going through all of these theories tonight. I'm sure whoever 
<laughs> is a proponent of any one of them might say, well, you forgot about this or that, and that's not my purpose here. Because I think, Rick, seriously, I think you did the best summary I've ever seen of this. And I've seen quite a few presentations. So I credit to Paul and to Rick for putting this on where we can see in a summary altogether, pros and cons, some of the map ideas and get some feedback. I mean, just a great job. That's all I have to say. And, and I appreciate Steve bringing it up. <laughs> I, I'm sitting here trying to, I'm working on a painting and so I'm not 100% focused <laughs> on what we're doing, but I, I really uh, have enjoyed the evening and, and what you've done here, Rick, so. Well, thanks, to, uh, Jonathan. I, I was hoping you would, would say something. I'm, I confess I'm not, uh, I, I'm not as well prepared on a Heartland model. I, I've, I've got the book on order for uh, Meldrum and I don't know how your theory is different from his. I guess I should get your book too. And maybe we'll have to get you on my podcast sometime. Sure, I'd be happy to come on. That, basically what happened with Rod and I, cause I, I was a total Sorensen guy for decades. You know, I, I was a friend with an archeologist who did a peer review of his book before it was published and we went through it together. I mean, I've been following this. I've been all through Central America to the sites and so on. And it wasn't until I had some questions about the origins of it that I, a mutual friend introduced me to Rod Meldrum and that's how I got involved with this whole thing. And Rod and I talked about this at length and, and my issue with him was he never had gone through the text of the Book of Mormon to explain how the text describes what he was saying. And so that's why I, went, I wrote that book, Moronis America, to go through the entire text, kind of chapter by chapter, to show how a, a plausible, at least in my mind, explanation for how it fits the text. So, that, so it's not really a difference so much as a difference of approach, I guess. I'm, I mean, most of you know I'm, I'm a retired lawyer now, and so I'm, I'm very analytical when I go through this stuff. And I, I follow the adage of trust, but verify, right? So I don't take anybody's word for anything. And I, I wanna know really what's behind it. And that's kind of, Rod and I have, have taken a little different approach that way. So but I'd be happy to explain it on your podcast anytime, Rick, so. All right, whether I've read your book or not. <laughs> yeah, I, always feel, I always feel bad when I don't read some books and I feel bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll send you a uh, review copy, no problem. Oh, wow, that'd be awesome, thanks. <laughs> Well, but there's about 20 books that Jonathan has put out there that you need to read in order to pull all the pieces together because uh, he has detailed everything from the Benjamin Winchester uh, background to the single Moroni or single Camorra, uh, the uh, river going north uh, for Sidon. He has a, a tremendous amount of research and it, uh, I agree that he has some difficulties and especially when uh, when we had Josh Gailey a couple of weeks ago giving his model, and he pointed out that that you have to have two languages to uh, match what the Book of Mormon says, uh, mm -hmm. two written languages, and that's one of the obstacles that I that I don't see in the uh, Heartland model. Um, matter of fact, it's one that that I think only shows up in the Malay model, and well, possibly Africa too, and Central America, of course. And of course, I, I've written answers to all that, but I don't need to get into it here. I appreciate that, though, Paul. So yeah, lots of lots of beautiful research on Jonathan's books, and he'll be coming back in another uh, a few weeks. On About a month, yeah, uh, yeah, we've got we've got him scheduled for the appendix to uh, what's that? What's that? Uh, the, the brought to light book, I think you said. Right, right, right. And so you know, here I am intrigued by appendices to his books. There's a lot of just really interesting stuff here. <laughs> Bear with us, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a lot of information about perspectives on the Book of Mormon. <laughs> yeah.